It's a great pleasure to have you here, Herman, uh, with this introductory talk of us. Yes, <laughs> but uh, have you here? So, oh, oh, you yes, views on yes uh, thank you very much. Okay. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and thanks also for the, giving me the opportunity to talk about the topic today. Uh, supermembrane theory is something that's been around for a long time, right? It was formulated uh, well, I'll give the references for the moment. Um, but it's been around for what almost 40 years now. And uh, <coughs> And, but progress has been a little stagnant, and uh, we will see why in, um, in a minute. So this work, the work I'm going to talk about, has been is based on uh, work I did with uh, Olaf Lechtenfeld. It's just just appeared very recently, and of course then there's this old paper relating supermembrane to the uh, model of in theory. That's, that's also no, 34 years. No, it, it's, a, it's a bit funny because I know as I grow older, I realize it's kind of takes time for a subject, sometimes for a subject to progress and uh, based on progress, but then I sort of extrapolate you know, the next step could be what in 30 years or so. <laughs> it may not be around anymore. Well, it also, there's also some previous work which uh, we did. Uh, that also motivated this kind of approach, which is sometimes from more conventional approaches to. So, so let me start out very uh, with a simple, some simple remarks. Um, this is a question that's often asked why, I mean, theory, why not more extended objects, higher extended objects? And, um, the uh, the idea that extended objects could play a role in physics uh, goes back to Dirac six years ago. He had the idea that the electron would membrane, somehow relativistic membrane, where which is stabilized by um, the interplay between the membrane tension, which tends to sort of membrane contract and the electrostatic repulsion. Um, Sorry, for the interruption. I think the people online they're saying they can't hear you properly. Ah, so I'm gonna just uh you know, well, okay. Maybe it's at, at max already. I mean if it's not too much of a trouble, can you stay in ah, this region okay. because I don't mind the not wander around. Uh, okay, so I'll stay put. <laughs> Okay, so to repeat what I said, the idea of, have, of using membranes to relativistic membranes to do things goes back to the rock. And, uh, um, just a, a brief summary of what uh, how you do this. Uh, the basic uh, idea is the number go to action for a P, and I'll do it for PP brain, by the way. Um, so you have uh, some extended object. And you have a target space, target space coordinate that depends on the P brain coordinates and the, the time parameter tau. And the R runs from one to P. So the string is a one brain, the standard member is two brain, and so on and so on. And then the action is simply given by this, which is the uh, area element of the um, metric, which is defined like this. And, and notice that here I just do this for a flat target space from Minkowski metric, because otherwise it gets too complicated. I mean, even in string theory, people don't know how to, not fully understood how to do non-trivial space, target space and backgrounds. So this is, this is uh, the metric determinant. And then there's one dimensional dimension for a constant in front, which is so-called membrane tension. Um, which has uh, dimensions, uh, inverse mass to the power of the uh, uh, dimension of the membrane, space, I mean, the world volume. So that's, that's where you, you see, this is a rather complicated expression when you substitute this into formula, it gets very complicated. 
But there's the equivalent way uh, to formulate the theory, which is um, which people refer to as the Polyakov action, although Polyakov himself always points out that it wasn't him who wrote this down. He actually points out that Liouville action should be called Polyakov action. This should be called something else. <laughs> Anyway, this is such, so here the dependent variables are just the target space coordinates like this. Here you have both the target space coordinates and the world volume metric. And the Lagrangian is designed in such a way that when you solve the equations of motion for, uh, for, this, um, for the membrane uh, world volume metric, then you let back to this. So this is important to have this extra a term which is like a cosmological constant on the p brain. You, you notice that only for p plus one, which is the string, term is not there. But it's easy to check that you need this extra contribution in order to get back from this Polyakov type formula to the number root of form. Now, the crucial distinction between strings and p brains, and basically the reason why is everyone's working on string theory and not on membrane theory is the fact that for a string, for the string that exists a gauge uh, for which the equations of motion become linear. That just become three wave equations uh, with this uh, with target space and cost connection. An equivalent way of saying this is that um, for the string, you can gauge away uh, uh, the world volume metric completely just by making use of the diffeomorphisms, the world sheet diffeomorphisms, plus the extra ingredient that you have for the string, which is conformal invariance. That's three variables, and those can be used to eliminate the three um, degrees of freedom in the two by two uh, metric on the world sheet. So, and, and another thing that comes with this is that uh, when you do a path integral uh, for the string, you, in the Polyakov approach, you integrate over the target space metric, but you also integrate about of, um, over the world volume of the world sheet a metric and the target these target space coordinates. Then by choosing this gauge, the gravitational path integral is reduced to a finite dimensional integral. Which means unlike in gravity in higher dimensions, uh, it, it's not a functional integral anymore, but it's just an ordinary integral, which is still very complicated. But so then you end up with, uh, when you do this, uh, you end up with the Gaussian theory for the target space corner. Um, this is not the case for the, for the membrane. Because in three dimensions, you have three different morphisms, but no conformal uh, invariance anymore. And then you have six degrees of freedom for the world's volume metric. And even if you fix the gauge, you're left with a, a real functional integral, not, not just an ordinary integral. In fact, I think there's even, uh, there's another objection here. Even if you could, could do the Polyakov integral, there's no guarantee that if you took this formula, integrate over the world volume metric, it would be led to this. It's already sometimes obvious because it's still left with degrees, metric degrees of freedom on the world volume. So. This is yeah, you have to throw right here. Like this? Just just you know, this is mouse. 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 Ah. I'm on the page. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Now, yeah, now I think you can use the pointer. Ah, I see, I see. I've been talking too much, too long. Or was, was, was... No, I think I went back to this. Ah, ah, okay, okay. Anyway, once one has uh, uh, these extended object series, of course, the question make them, how can you make them super symmetric? Because you would expect the supersymmetric series to have uh, better properties. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, there's this famous uh, scan of P brain supersymmetric P brain th series with, uh, with that P, which lists the possible P's and also target space dimensions. And then it turns out that there's a unique, maximally supersymmetric Superman 
membrane theory in space dimension, target space dimensions equals 11, which was formulated by Eric Braxhoff, Bergen Seskin, and Paul Townsend back in uh, 35 years ago. And uh, I would claim that this is a candidate for non perturbative formulation of string theory. In fact, if you take that point of view, it's, it's a little bit hard to understand why people stick with uh, string theory because, you know, if, 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 if the philosophy is that you should go for the most symmetric and most extended theory, why stop in the middle? Uh, even as a string theory, uh, the, the standard string theory is not the most symmetric one because the, there are also theories with n equals two, n equals four um, world sheets with asymmetry, which has the wrong critical dimension. But apart from that, uh, so why not go all the way? And um, particularly, I want to argue that what you have here is a theory that must be dealt with in a different way from you know standard approaches to string theory, and it's a theory I'm claiming. I, I claim uh, which is uh, non perturbative from the outset. So I'll, I'll provide some arguments for that. Um, okay, now the, the other result here is that this uh, theory, this is back to my own work with uh, Bernard Bewick and Jens Hoppe of 1988, where it was shown that this theory can be obtained as the end to infinity limit of a maximally supersymmetric SUN matrix theory. I will explain this connection. Now, there's been very little progress so far, as I've said before, uh, because the main problem uh, remains as unsolved as ever, and the main unsolved problem is quantization of this. I mean, even finding classical solutions is not so easy, <coughs> uh, but, but this, this, this is the central problem. And this has to do with the fact, first of all, again, there's no gauge which linearizes the equations of motion. So no matter what you do, you're dealing with an attractive theory, uh, which also means determination of correlation functions cannot be reduced to free field theory computations unlike string theory. String theory, essentially every calculation you do is a free field theory computation. This is why you can do all the things that string theory is true. I've also shown you the uh, Polyakov uh, type action, but because of the nonlinearities uh, of the membrane theory, the covariant quantization a la Polyakov looks basically hopeless. And of course, there's the question uh, is there a critical dimension? Already classically, the uh, target space dimensions are restricted to four numbers four, five, seven, eleven. That's Exactly like in supersymmetric Young Mills theory, where the target space dimension is on S. Uh, but then one would expect that out of those four, one is singled out by the requirement of, of consistency with the um, with quantum mechanics. So this question has been around from the very beginning and still hasn't been answered. But you know it's working yet. So the, at the moment, the only realistically feasible approach seems to be light cone gauge quantization with a flat Minkowski background. And this is something that was already done in the, uh, by Bergsdorf, Senskin, and Townsend early on. Um, but even with this large light cone, which is what I will do in the remainder, uh, there remain difficulties. And these difficulties are mirrored in the inferior matrix model. As I said, this theory can be approximated or can be obtained or derived as the end to infinity limit of this theory. But then there's a question about you now, how would you do check if the critical dimension is 11? In string theory, you simply calculate the Lorentz algebra, target space Lorentz algebra, and then you see that it just works in the critical dimension. This calculation has been con con contemplated, but never really performed. What you can show is that classically, if you don't work with quantum commutators, with, but with Poisson brackets, classical Lorentz invariance is broken for finite n, but it is recovered in the end to infinity limit. Furthermore, there's no analog of the analog of the Veneziano formula. This is really what started off string theory. Uh, there's no analog of this, and I will tell you why 
um, you know, it's it's possible why this it's, this is so difficult. I will say a few more words about uh, that these uh, associated vertex operators and what you will have to do in order to compute such amplitudes. So the present approach is uh, based on the fact that the supermembrane theory can be approximated like this or reformulated as a one-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory or matrix theory where the gauge group is the group of area preserving diffeomorphism on the map. I will explain. And of course, it could do, to, in order to do membrane theory, it could deal with this gauge theory directly. You could skip the SVN approximation and, uh, and work right away with the N equals infinity theory. By the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. So let me just go through some basics of the light cone uh, gauge description of the membrane theory. So as I said, you have target space coordinates uh, x mu when mu runs from the zero to um, so ij. The ij's are the membrane coordinates, wall volume coordinates, and the mu runs over the targets uh, response to target space coordinates. Then you have the stunt, and then also there are fermionic components. I, I will just carry them along without getting too much into the fermionic details, which are a bit complicated. But anyway, so I will mostly mention just on the side. So with these formulas, you can calculate the induced targets, uh, the induced world volume metric. And there's also a sort of a rectangular field line. Uh, which is a more elementary quantity, but which you need for the supersymmetry theory. Now, target space uh, light cone coordinates, target space light cone gauge means that you split the coordinates like this, transversal and uh, x plus and x minus, where this is the usual definition. And then you equate the x plus basically with the world volume time coordinate. So all of this is familiar from string theory. Uh, there's also uh, a corresponding uh, condition on the fermions. Uh, the thetas are th 32 component real Majorana spinners in target space. Condition just halves the number of fermion trees. And with this formula, it's, it's relatively easy, straightforward to calculate the induced uh, World volume metric, which you see here. Um, okay, and this uh, this is then something you substitute into the number go to uh, action. So it's a th determinant of three by three matrix, but it proves convenient to write this as the determinant of the spatial two by two spatial matrix um, and uh, some factor. This is just a standard formula. Well, this delta is uh, depends on the time time coordinate, also the off diagonal coordinates. Where these URs are um, uh, defined like this, so it contains a combination of the derivative of the longitudinal, the x minus coordinate plus other stuff. Okay, and then when you substitute this uh, to the supersymmetric action, which is essentially a generalization of the green Schwartz action for the membrane, then uh, there's some simplification in the sense that all kinds of higher order fermionic terms simply disappear, and you're just left with this. So, this is still the uh, metric determinant, the square root of that, and this is uh, the fermionic contribution. And you have the membrane tension in front, and we'll just keep it. It will be uh, important in a moment. Now, initially, the membrane has a dimension of inverse mass to, to a power of three in this case, uh, but you can make it dimensionless by referring it to some reference mass. That reference mass can be taken to be the Planck mass, but at that stage, it doesn't have any physical meaning. In theory, what you would have to do is you would have to calculate four point graviton amplitude. And from this, you extract how uh, the relation between these membrane or the string tension and the actual Newton constant. This is 
Um, okay, so that's uh, the puzzle good. And now, it was another 35 years ago um, by Darth Howe, Nami, and Kelly Stell. Um, that you can reobtain the super string from the super membrane by uh, a procedure called double dimensional reduction. And what it means is that you equate the tens. We have two spatial membrane coordinates. And what you do is you identify the 11th uh, target space coordinate with the second uh, membrane coordinate. Um, and we also do something with the fermions. And then, uh, so it's one thing, it's, it's like, you know, compactifying, wrapping the membrane. And then uh, by doing this, uh, this 11th dimension uh, is described by a certain radius R10. And then there's this famous result by Gibson that this 11th, uh, radius of the 11th uh, uh, coordinate can be equated with uh, the string coupling to the power two thirds. It means that the membrane tension for the W dimensional reduced theory can be equated with uh, the string, first string tension and uh, the first power of the um, string coupling. But this is an important point because it also illustrates something about perturbative versus non perturbative. In string theory, you have a double expansion of alpha prime and you have the string coupling. Two are sort of intertwined in 11 dimensions. If you do it in 11 dimensions, you cannot tell uh, one from the other. Instead, you just have this single, single uh, quantity in the, the membrane tension. So this. As to emphasize this again, that this formula ties together two key parameters of string theory and it uh, expresses them in terms of the membrane tension. So if you think about a, a scheme where you would do a, a perturbation expansion in the membrane tension, it would not be so easy to disentangle from this what this would correspond to in terms of string perturbation theory. Okay, so uh, now go through the canonical of the, of the system, you know, defining canonical momenta. This is very much analogous to uh, string theory, a standard string theory, uh, although technically a little more involved. And uh, so you have the momenta, you have a constraint, canonical constraint for the spatial diffeomorphisms. So R runs from one and two. So RS labeled the spatial coordinates, as I said. And then the Hamiltonian, just like in string theory, corresponds to the minus component of the, um, of the canonical momentum. And then you substitute everything into the formulas, uh, just to the standard formulas, and you end up with this Hamiltonian. So you see that, uh, uh, you see that uh, this has the following form. So this is P squared. Uh, and this looks like a potential, which is multiplied by the string tension squared. Uh, and this is the spatial determinant of the spatial metric. So this is like a potential. If you reduce it to the string, this is just x dot prime square, x dot square plus x prime square. You have exactly the same formula. And then there's family contribution. Well, you need to exploit gauge three a little further. But at the end of the day, you end up with this mass formula m squared by uh, you know this is just the standard formula. Uh, so when you multiply this by zero, by p zero, you see that this drops out. You also have to rescale the fermions, and then this is what you get. So m squared is in form uh, an integral over p squared plus potential, and then there's fermion contribution. The prime means that you have taken out the zero momentum. So there's a contribution which describes the motion of the membrane as a whole, and it's sorry, x, x zero and uh, p zero. And the rest, this is something that's that's related to the internal excitation of the membrane. Yeah. So the T that you have in the Hamiltonian is that membrane tension, right? 
Yeah, that's still the memory page. And but when, made them into this. Right. And when you say that, if you reduce, if you press K, you mean you have double reduction? But you yes, control. that's right. That's, then, then this thing just becomes X prime squared, where prime is, would be the derivative with respect to the first membrane, spatial membrane format. Now, uh, okay, so we have this, but then, then the question is what, what's the spectrum of the theory? And uh, the first thing is how do you recover 11 dimensional supergravity from this? And uh, this is, I, I, I will just be very sketchy to this because you also have a zero mode for the supercharges, which also split in light form gauge fashion. So we have this algebra for the zero mode supercharges. And then it's a known result that the smallest representation of the super algebra just has these uh, bosonic degrees of freedom where these are representations of x 9 transverse for x 9 so it's the 44, that's the graviton in the level dimensions. This is the tone field. And these are the degrees of freedom associated with the gravitino. And this means that the massless multiplet of the 11 dimensional supergravity would come out as follows. It would be just this kinematically uh, described uh, 11 dimensional supergravity multiplet times. And then this is an eigenfunction of the mass operator. And this mass operator must have a zero eigenvalue. Um, and once you have such a, once you find a normalizable wave function of the internal modes of the membrane, obeying this equation, then you can say that the theory has um, um, random dimensional supergravity as, as the lowest uh, excitation. Now in string theory, just to, to illustrate this a little bit, for the string, you have of course exactly the same kind of a calculation, except that uh, the ground state decomposes the product of left and right movers, is probably simpler. And furthermore, so uh, these states are very simply described because they're infinite products of harmonic oscillator states. Uh, so the ground state is simply a direct product of um, a, a zero mode a ground state, both both on a ground state and um, remote family ground state. Uh, now, each of these are informally infinite products for all the ground states for the various oscillators. And then you build the um, spectrum of the theory just by acting with the harmonic with the string oscillators, both bosonic and fermionic, on these ground states. And that gives you just the standard um, uh, spectrum of excited string states. So you have in the string, super string, you have an exceedingly simple structure. It's just harmonic oscillator. It's not more than this. Uh, the only thing that complicates life a little bit is the extra constraints on the number of right and left moving states. Well, life is not so simple with the super memory. Because uh, what was shown also 25 years ago, that um, operator has a continuous spectrum for the supermembrane. Um, when we derived this result, we thought that was the coup de grace for the supermembrane because uh, you know it would mean that the theory would be very unstable. There's no gap between the massless states and the first excited states. But you should interpret this result in a different way. But what you can see already here is that unlike for the string, in the way to do string theories, you first, first quantize and then you second quantize. This is not possible for the membrane. This is the first indication that we're dealing with non perturbative uh, uh, um, So that's one thing. First of all, there's, there's the issue of uh, how to interpret this continuous spectrum. But the other issue, if you want to be sure there's a level dimensional supergravity, you have to show that there exists a normalizable a ground state. And that ground state wave function is exceedingly complicated. It's not a simple direct product of bosonic and fermionic. And uh, if you think about the SCN matrix model approximation already for uh, SU2, which is the simple, but the wave function fermionic box space has two to the 24. Uh, dimensions. 
So that's still the list. There's been a lot of uh, work on on the existence or non-existence of this uh, massless space for uh, n equals two or three, but there's very little about general. Now, so, as I said, we want to reformulate the membrane theory as a gauge theory, a matrix, supersymmetric matrix, matrix model with young with a young Mills gauge group that is the area preserving group of area preserving feature morphisms, or we'll just this by ATD. Well, in two dimensions, we're just talking about the spatial diffeomorphisms, they are two. Uh, and then area preserving diffeomorphisms satisfy this uh, uh, constraint that are divergence free. It's just a reference metric, never mind this. Uh, and in this case, in two dimensions, in the uh, if your morphism generate uh, uh, parameter of A is constrained, then you can locally express it like this as a graph. But this is for those you can trade with uh, uh, two component parameter by a single scalar parameter graph like this. And then you can also rewrite the uh, um, action of a different morphism, say on a scalar field by this, substitute this formula, and then you get this simple expression, which is like a, uh, some kind of Poisson or knee bracket really, uh, which we now write like this with, with definition here. And this uh, actually, this was first discovered by uh, Jeffrey Goldstone and uh, Jens Hopper back in 1983. It's actually the part of the content of Jens Hopper's uh, thesis. And they showed what, which is actually easy to check. And this bracket actually does obey all the requirements of a Lie algebra bracket. Antisymmetry is obvious, but you also have the Jacobi identity. It's also easy to check. Uh, well, there are also uh, more complicated diffeomorphisms, but we won't get into this. So we'll just, we'll just uh, use make you bracket here and the fact that diffeomorphisms can be right in terms of this lead bracket. So um, as I said, one has to go through various stages of gauge fixing. Um, so this is this was the offline or a component of the induced work volume metric. So you can choose this gauge. And then at that stage there's still a residual gauge invariance. Uh, remember the diffeomorphism was phi r, but there's another one phi, which uh, has this form, and that's that's an invariance, even the residual invariance. Even furthermore, uh, this has to be satisfied if you want to solve the equations for x minus. Uh, I showed this before the UR, which is at zero, starts out with PR X minus. And if you want to solve that equation, you need a consistency condition. The curl of this expression must vanish, and which is equivalent to this. And then you can express the X minus in terms of the transverse coordinates. This is, this is also what you have in string theory, but there it's just one over P plus, and because it's just a single, I mean, it's just um, x prime equals something that can always be solved. But here you have two conditions, and this is why you need this extra uh, constraint. So that uh, already shows you that here as well, things life is much more complicated than for the spring. But this is basically one of our p plus times uh, corresponding expression. But you can also exploit this APD bracket to rewrite it in a more suggestive form. So this is the spatial induced spatial uh, world volumetric or the spatial part of it. And uh, if you now calculate this as a two by two determinant, then you see that it can be rewritten in terms of this uh, D bracket, which I spoke before. That's simple algebra. Substitute this into the Lagrangian, and then you see that. You get something that looks more and more like Daniel's theory. 
the sense that the young Mills theory also has this quartic cosmology, it has this quartic contribution to replace the uh, Poisson brackets by commutators. Okay. So well, that uh, you now see that. Um, ah, this is now here already put. Uh, I should have put the t squared. I had the t squared in front of it, but the young Mills has a g. So the two become the same if you identify the membrane tension, the dimensionless membrane tension, with this uh, young Mills coupling. It means basically that uh, in principle, there's no way to study the small and large tension limit of the, of the theory, this slight conformulation. Uh, by translating into young Mills type theory, and then a uh, small, large tension of the supermembrane corresponds to weak, strong coupling limit of the ATV gauge. Now, how do you approximate uh, APD, the APD group? Uh, by simply expanding um, you know, any function on the membrane, so here the spatial coordinates, into a complete set of functions. So if you have a spherical membrane, this would just be the usual spherical harmonics. On torus, uh, you would just have a Fourier, double Fourier expansion, and so on. Principle also exists for higher genus. And then the point is that you simply truncate uh, this sum at finite n. Uh, you know, the counting just works out right, because if you look at the spherical harmonics, it goes like one, three, um, five, seven, and when you add it up, it's always dimension of S U N. So uh, then define the structure content of this group just in the usual way. So here's the new bracket, you project it, and then this defines you the dimensional group, um, which is just uh, uh, these, these structure constants are then just structure constants of the PD. And with this, and with this truncation, you end up with a max, with a supersymmetric or maximally supersymmetric matrix model Lagrangian, which looks like, looks like this. This is something you've seen before, I guess. Um, and we have all already simplified a little bit by uh, working with the sixteen component spinners rather than the original thirty-two component spinners. Um, and the spinners of SO9. So this just this important spinner representation. So this is a model that uh, everybody knows because this is, like, people know this. Uh, this is just what you get when you take 10 dimensional square Mills theory and reduce it to one time dimension. That's just the, uh, uh, that's just the supersymmetry matrix. Actually, these models were already obtained long ago. Um, now more than 40 years ago by uh, Von Wittenberg. The names and I think also Claude Son and Halke. Um, you now still need to supplement, supplement it. Now the APD constraint then becomes just a Gauss constraint of this uh, one dimensional matrix model. And this is of course this very same Lagrange that was uh, it underlies the MC proposal that was 1996. It's exactly the same model for finite n. Now they have a, a picture, well, their picture is based on assuming the zero frames as uh, basic constituents of uh, M theory. But uh, when you talk about the n to infinity limit, this of membrane theory, which means that if Somebody can show that this limit exists, and uh, you've just got succeeded in constructing supermembrane. Uh, it's nothing but. I've already said that uh, one shouldn't think of this theory as a first quantized uh, theory. That's, of course, more obvious in, in about the theory in terms of zero brain, uh, uh, particles, zero brains. Um, then you already see that. Uh, yeah, more than one. Uh, of course, there's a question how to get the 
uh, string, massive string excitations out of this, and that's the that's conjectured way of doing it, which I cannot explain. So I've said before that um, you should think of the supernova as a kind of non perturbative description of the string theory. You know, everything sort of fits with what we know. For example, also this, this written result that we should think of the 11th dimension as being uh, related to the coupling. Uh, now, this picture I took uh, from a lecture by Thibaut Danois. Uh, what this shows is the following. So here you have the bar spectrum uh, for the string, the string. And here you have the, uh, this is the string coupling. And uh, the spectrum that you know from string theory textbooks, the discrete spectrum, that's of course the spectrum for G string coupling equal to zero. But the uh, one supposes that as you switch on the string coupling, uh, states are split up. So it looks like this. And as you take the limit, uh, string coupling to infinity, they sort of merge into a continuum. Uh, well, Thibaut Damour has some other considerations with dark holes and so on. But, uh, you know, I've just, I've just want to show this, that it's sort of this trait, how this fits with the philosophy I'm, I'm preaching here. Uh, so, uh, again, this, this is an indication that we're dealing with on perturbative description of uh, well, our theory is just non perturbative. So, the new thing about what we did is now to think about the, um, the path integral because ultimately you would like to compute correlation functions and so on. Uh, and we say that this, this is something that uh, you can in principle calculate these correlators um, using a path integral approach for this APD and matrix model. So uh, this so this would be correlators like this, depends on the gauge coupling <coughs> or the membrane tension, same thing. And you have to integrate over all degrees of freedom, in particular because it's a gauge theory of something to do for the pop-off and so on, uh, which I indicate here. So here are the vertex operators. I'll show you what they, they look like in a moment, or some of them. And then here you have the exponential, the action. And this action now is not just the original action, but also has the ghost piece as would be appropriate for the for uh, Youngville's quantization of Youngville's theory. Um, so it's just the... Um, Oh, what is this? Uh, this is the kinetic ghost. Uh, then we have this usual term uh, here, which would be like uh, T mu N mu, if you have Feynman uh, uh, or Landau, Landau gauge, and then this, you have a Feynman parameter here, so I've got this gauge fixing function. It's such that, as you know, if you take limit alpha to zero, you just put the theory on the main hypersurface. Now, the present formulation now makes use of the fact that this theory is quadratic in the fermions. Maybe, therefore, you can do the fermionic integral, which is the Gaussian integral. And uh, then you get a fermionic determinant, uh, which is called Matthew Salam determinant, or I call it Matthew Salam Seiler determinant, because Erhard Seiler back in 1975 use this, this, this formalism to actually prove constructive field theory, the existence of a uh, um, Yukawa, Yukawa model in two dimensions. You integrate over the fermions and then you get this determinant and I've uh, taken out the free term. So it's essentially one plus and then um, some operator K. And this has the form of a fractal determinant. But there's also a factor of uh, a power of one half because we're dealing with real fermions, Majorana fermions. So this is really a subject. 
Uh, so the integral kernel, because we're in one dimension, uh, this is the fermionic fermionic propagator in one dimension. Then you have this, uh, yeah, Mukava like uh, interaction. Higher dimensions is just uh, essentially just the covariant D slash. And this is the fermion propagator in one dimension, which properties. And this means that the determinant principle is definable. So as a, as a genuine, honest uh, determinant. Of course, life gets a little more complicated if you go from finite SUN to area preserving uh, morphisms, because then you have these labels. Uh, the, the, the APD group is still lives with these membrane coordinates as labels. You shouldn't think of them as, as coordinates, but as, as labels. And uh, now in principle, we can start doing computations with this by using this famous formula, and then we just expand the gauge parameter. Um, however, and now, now comes an important point, and this is related to the question of existence or non-existence of the, um, infinity limit. Simply substitute this formula and you make the expansion and then you simply so you expand the log, log of one plus k so it's just a standard expansion but then there's a trace and then the presence of this uh, delta function um, the factor of delta of zero which on the face of it is not well defined. Uh, and this is actually what, if you just do this for the bosonic theory, that looks like it can kill the bosonic matrix model. Looks like this limit does not exist for the super model. Uh, now we found a way out in the using my old work. Uh, um, as a result, that states following that I can map the theory to three. Um, by making performing nonlinear transformation of the variables, which is such that the, the cobian of this transformation equals the fermionic return. Uh, the, um, on, on my first slide, I had uh, I several mentioned several papers. There, this, this result is actually proven for higher dimension Yang-Yang theory, but then it's also valued for the dimensional reduced theory. And this, this transformation, you can actually work out explicitly, which is what you do in our paper up to order G to the power six. And what you see here uh, is, uh, so this is the original target space variable. And I've suppressed the sigma dependence, just otherwise the formula would, would be, look, look too complicated. So all these X's also depend on this whole chain sigma, which I had before. And here you have the this APD bracket. And then you can check that if you take this formula, um, you get multiple nested brackets, I guess more, more complicated higher orders. When you substitute this in expand it out, you will get exactly the um matrix, the bosonic part of the matrix model advantage. And of course, the fermions, they're sort of hide here, uh, hidden here because uh, this, uh, this Jacobi is swallowed up by the, by the um, fermion determinant. Now, never mind the details, it's, it takes some effort to actually verify this formula. But the really important thing here is that you divide this formula from finite for the SUN approximation, but once you have it in this form, it's straightforward to take the infinity, infinity limit simply by replacing the Young Mills uh, uh, gauge group B brackets by APD brackets. This thing is perfectly well defined also for the infinity case. Now, what does this mean? This means that I've not been able to uh, map the theory to a quote unquote free theory. And it's such that uh, you know I can work directly with the n equals n. And let me repeat the important feature here. This is where supersymmetry is absolutely crucial. That uh, I have a Jacobian that sort of 
swallowed up by the permionic determinant. If I'm in the purely bosonic theory, I could still try to do this, but then I would be stuck with this extra factor, which would produce all these delta of zero infinities. Uh, I've got five minutes. So, in other words, this divergence cancels between Jacobian and the product of fermion determinants to give a finite result uh, for this transformation. And um, by the way, you also see this in the SCN approximation because when you do the traces, you have to do uh, uh, such sums and they're proportional to n. Although I think you need a different power, but anyway, it diverges with n, so you cannot take the infinite limit. So, what we conclude is that for the supermembrane of finite m, uh, the matching divergence factors keep the integral measure well defined as you take the infinite. And that only works for the supersymmetric theory. But this is what I would call the renormalizability of the supermembrane. In the old days, people always said, well, most only membrane theory is non renormalizable. But what does this really mean? Well, one way. The meaning to this statement is, is the way I've done it just here. And for the bosonic, the brain doesn't work. So, presumably, there's no quantized uh, bosonic membrane. Actually, this, if I, I learned only recently that George Savidi back in 1990 had already raised this issue with the into infinity limit, but at the time, uh, nobody paid attention. Uh, ah, the other thing is uh, that's also shown in our paper that uh, unlike the usual uh, series expansion quantum field theory, take this um, expansion, it does have a non zero radius of convergence. It's unusual in string theory because normally, or in quantum field theory, because normally when you sum up the renormalized perturbation theory, uh, say to or any quantum field theory, Still left with combinatorial divergences because the number of Feynman diagrams goes like a power of n factorial. So the one over n factorial from the Taylor series is not enough because it's sort of overwhelmed by the number of diagrams, which goes faster than n factorial. So here, by doing this trick, we actually have improved the situation. So far as the um, uh, that this series does have a finite radius of convergence. So I have uh, what five minutes for. I uh, just want to say a few words about physical correlators. One would now like to exploit this to calculate something. Uh, and uh, yes, well, first of all, you have to come up with the, the membrane analogs of uh, string vertex operators. But I just this this work we did back uh, in 2000 with Jan Plechka and Aaron Dati das Kupka, um, where we constructed uh, such vertex operators after obey stringent constraints. Particularly, there was work by Mike Free uh, and Mike um, and Kwon, where they did this for the 11 dimensional point particle. And our result has to be such that it matches and varies reductions to these known results. So here is uh, the creative uh, graviton vertex operator, or the classical analog of the of what would be turn out to be the uh, vertex operator of the membrane theory. And it's a rather complicated expression with again involving these APT brackets. One consistency criterion is that if you uh, now impose double dimensional reduction, this thing should must actually decompose into the standard expression for a string vertex operator, in particular, factorize into left and right moving, uh, which this one, uh, this form, of course, it doesn't. This, this goes like dx squared plus x to the fourth. And only after you do the reduction and do perform some calculation, you will see that it actually does decompose in the product, product of left and right movers or left and right moving vertex of time. 
Um, so uh, I've just shown the longitudinal the, the, uh, the, the expression for the transverse um, um, graviton uh, polarizations here, but there are corresponding expressions for the longitudinal components. There's a corresponding expression for the gravitino vertex operator and one for the three form uh, vertex operator. Um, so, in principle, uh, we can now sit down and start doing the calculation, which is something we haven't done yet, which because it's technically complicated. Um, but maybe I should. Uh, so, for instance, the four graviton correlator might provide a relatively in the membrane tension a calculable supermembrane analog of the Virasuro Shapiro amplitude of string theory. Uh, it would be interesting to see how this. this Dependent on double dimensional reduction. You see, it works. This dependent on the string tension and the coupling. Uh, I should also mention that uh, we have tried, but apparently, it does not appear to exist an analog of the massive superstring graphics operators, which would be in agreement with the fact that there's a continuous spectrum, which I cannot interpret in terms of one particle state. Well, there are many other uh, things one could do now, but they're not one of them is easy. So let's let me get to the sequence. Um, I would like to repeat, stress again, that due to its uniqueness properties, the level dimensional supermembrane is a prime candidate for non double string expression M theory. So I would say that if, you know, what is M theory? Everybody talks about M theory. But nobody tells you what it is. And uh, here, you know, here's a concrete proposal. And I'm saying it could be just this supermembrane theory, uh, which is a very concrete theory. You can write down the Lagrangian, because the Lagrangian theory, everything works. But the problem is, of course, it's much harder than string theory. I've mentioned, emphasized, and this was one of the main outcomes of this investigation, that uh, the end to infinity limit likely. Exists both for the supersymmetric theory, but not for the purely um, bosonic one. And what needs to be done now is to develop or exploit this in one way or another to develop new computational tools to make a quantum supermembrane more computationally accessible. So, uh, uh, that's that's what has been lacking. Uh, yeah, this is a good point to stop. Thank you very much. So you mentioned about the connection of uh, R2P. So I'm wondering if that's uh, uh, from holography point of view, one use uh, supermembrane theory. Uh, holography. I mean, in, in some sense, uh, um, what you have here is a sort of precursor of the gauge gravity duality because. We're associating a theory of gravity, membrane yeah. theory, with the Young Mills theory. Yeah. But it, it's not quite the, what people have in mind when they talk about gauge gravity duality, where you talk about ABS and the boundary, but it's it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you like, yes, it's another way to do holography. Can you remind me of what uh, you told the Ah, of a sphere. Oh, yeah. they, they, they did it just for the sphere. Uh, so they formulated the, uh, the membrane theory on the sphere. Then they noticed that uh, you can reformulate it as this as a gauge theory. Well, it's not quite it's not quite the way they said it, but essentially yeah. that's what it is. But they only did this for the sphere. By using spherical harmonics and checking that actually this bracket does this structure constant do approach structure constant. A little later, by several different groups, it's also done for the torus, actually easier. Uh, and then, actually, there was a general theorem by uh, I think like the German mathematician. 
um, Schlichtenmeier and two others. So that's actually true for any genus. So if you take a pretzel membrane or whatever, this is a membrane interaction for a group. Well, membrane interactions um, in what sense? I mean, the sense like in string theory when you merge, and yeah. uh, but here it's it's more difficult because, as I said, this you know, it's not so clear how interpret whether this kind of interpretation is actually the yeah, my my way of ex, is explaining this sometimes is. Um, you know, you have to solve this equation m squared psi equals zero, find the normalizable eigenstate. And it's a little bit like, uh, you know, if you were to do QED in a Schrodinger functional approach, we say h psi equals d e psi, where this h is the full Hamiltonian of QED or Young Mills. Uh, and even apart from questions of renormalizability and so on, uh, if you could find this eigenstate psi, it would look nothing like a one particle state. It would be very non perturbative, very complicated wave function. No, so it's, it's the intuition that we have that, you know, there are one particle states in quantum fields here are not really one particle states. Yeah. Bounded by virtual clouds and so on. This is this is my picture of what this wave function really is. Not it's not in some sense it's not a one particle uh, quantity. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I mean you can go through these steps for the five brain, but. Um, So the crucial uh, step in um, relating this to Young Null's theory um, okay. is this formula, right? So that the fact that the determinant can be written, the two by two determinant can be written in this particular way as a square of a D bracket. We did this for the uh, five brain. You end up with a two by two, but by a five by five determinant, and then you would have something like uh, this wouldn't be a Lie bracket. That's what it's called. So there's well, a multi multi three three or four five entry dimension. Yes, exactly. Right? So that's it's that kind of generalization. So you lose the link and the theory. That would be terrible. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, there was this three dimensional control uh, theories, also of this kind yeah, of exactly. uh, structure with brackets. There were a lot of real three brackets, a number of brackets. That's what they call it. So you would have to replace this by a number of brackets. The membranes are like a push one by the sense that. Uh, the zero mod I can say that you can still identify something like a zero mass state with a one particle state. But anything else in the continuum is something much more complicated. Well, that's one thing I, I mentioned somewhere in the slide. The how do you come to the picture? The brain looks like this, okay? Uh, now, double dimensional reduction is in the regular chrome spikes, but this zero energy. And in this approximation, this double dimensional reduction, I will provide it by this. Some sense the membrane theory is really more like a second theory in the sense that it's not really fun to write. It means that somehow the vertex operator I'm showing is not a vertex operator in one part of the theory. It's more like, uh, you know, there are these multi string vertices. 
So I've never been able to uh, make this more concrete. Or what it should be, or what actually you can this into a practically manageable expression is not to. Well, everything, uh, all, the, all the information about the quality of the membrane is every topology, you have a, a, a different group of areas which are homophobic. This is what the information is about the topology of the space of the membrane. Um, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just saying A to B, uh, this is a strange, this is not a strange result because A, as I said, it's not strange. For any B bond surface, any genus membrane can cross the area of the cell in the Well, they also have the logical things that they find. This um, can a very strange result is to explain the generalized treatments of the question. And all of them can be possibly in this way. <coughs> The modular The modular as well. Um, is that the well, I think uh, it's, um, no, no, they're kind of outsiders. Um, you know, there's a little bit of extra because, of course, this has to be discussed more carefully at some point. Uh, I didn't, I only mentioned this dimension. The morphisms, area of the cell and the morphisms are uh, uh, generated by um, vector fields which are diverging streams. Now, locally, you can all solve it like this, but they're also harmonic. You know, it's just yeah, a Hodge yeah. decomposition. And Hodge decompositions will tell you the difference between a different genera. So, so there's a more, little more to this than you think. Just approximating uh, uh, these uh, the morphisms that can be represented. But the little there's a little bit extra here because for each book is more and more. And I've been thinking about so it's changing, there's also been this idea of universal yeah. space with all all genera. I do what we need to do is put some other of things from the Basic question when you say double dimensional, that's the uh, you yeah. uh, dimensional give us the well, what we do is actually you see how this space for the one require on the other. This depends on what you have to do. It's not just this cross axis to this cross axis to something to start with. And then when you substitute it into the formula, so that you can simplify it, for example. If you take um, question here, right? Uh, this is a, this is epsilon, so it's e one and two minus e one. So one of them needs to be this. So this is x i. Um, 
So this uh, the membrane is like x dot squared plus x to the four. So this becomes x dot squared plus x prime squared, which is what you So all all of this you have to somehow order to extract uh, theory from the membrane. Point like you said, the measure becomes orthological in sigma. Yes, that's, uh, that's one of the remaining difficulties. Yes, uh, because uh, uh, let's let you take this. Just sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. Just if, if you forgive the family on the terms. Uh, so this is x dot squared, mm -hmm. and the, the spatial derivatives are all in this interaction term. So if you put g equal to zero, the propagator is something that depends on t, but it's local, it's a delta function in the membrane coordinates. So uh, you know, we'll, we will have to find some way to deal with this because normally propagator Free propagator would uh, depend on all time and space coordinates. And here, spatial thing is uh, this delta function. When you try to do perturbation theory with this, then uh, it doesn't work. So, what we'll have to think about some better way of uh, doing this. Um, this I is something you, yeah? I remember some question. I'm sure there's work on this uh, because I mean, I know I'm pretty sure that this expression makes sense as a path integral. But, you know, it, it, that, for example, if you take, um, if you were to take, take a free field theory in two dimensions, where you just x dot squared plus x prime squared. And you know, say you put the parameter in front of x prime squared and expanded that parameter, then you have exactly the same thing. Uh, and then when you do this order by order, the thing is not defined, but you know very well that the, the property actually exists, it's very well defined. And here, I guess it's the same, but it's harder, it'd be harder to show because you cannot uh, do this. I mean, there's no explicit formula for this. Um, the prop propagator. So um, you'll have to think about how to do this properly. Okay. Thank you very much.